So this talk is on um, surface processes, as you can uh, maybe entangle them from the study uh, of rocks. And um, well, obviously, in order to obtain some information on processes that happened on the Earth, uh, you need to study rocks that formed at or near the Earth's surface. So that includes sedimentary rocks and volcanic rocks. And these are the rocks I will be talking about in this presentation. Um, so th uh, these rocks are also kind of uh, termed supracrustal rocks. And I'm just trying to move the slides. Um, so far, it's not really moving. Mm. Let's see. Okay, the slides don't want to move. With your cable, maybe? maybe? Uh, sorry? Ah, With there. Yeah, okay, now uh, it moved. Okay, let's see. All right, um, let me see. Ah, oh, yeah, it's moving now. Okay, that's fine. All right, so, um, uh, so I'm talking about supracrustal rocks. And uh, well, there are some places around the world, not that many, only two, where you find uh, supracrustal rocks of a very ancient age. And that one place would be in Greenland, and the other place would be in northern Canada. So now, like in Greenland, there's a famous locality known as the Isua Greenstone Belt. And that's a place uh, that has been studied for many decades. It um, exposes uh, pillow basalts, uh, sandstones and shales, iron formations, uh, rocks that are all indicative that they were once deposited in some ocean. Um, these rocks have been extensively uh, scrutinized, mainly for the search for, for early life uh, 3.8 billion years ago. Now there have been many reports, uh, many claims for life in these rocks, but there have also been many uh, claims that what people claim to be life may not be life uh, at all, or may not be as old as uh, people proposed. And some of these controversies are mainly because these rocks in Greenland, in northern Canada, are quite strongly deformed and heavily metamorphosed. So they have uh, been heated to temperatures well above 500 degrees. And as a result of this, they have lost quite a lot of um, primary information on the features um, that are preserved. So, in order to um, not uh, uh, deal with these kind of controversies, one way out is to look at better preserved rocks. Um, although they are not as old as the ones in, in Greenland, nevertheless, they are well preserved and uh, they are as old as 3.5 billion years. And these rocks are mainly restricted to well, the, the southern continents. Um, we find rocks um, of that nature in the Pilbara Craton in Western Australia. We find them in India in the Singbum Craton. And we find them in the Kapwa Craton of Southern Africa. So now the term Craton refers to a piece of, of continent um, that was that stabilized a long time ago. And in this map you see, you see Archean continents. Uh, in, in pink. And um, most of these continents, well, they only formed uh, in the late Archean at around 2.6 billion years ago. But uh, the Kapwa Craton and the Singbum Craton, well, are the oldest stable pieces of continental crust. They formed 3.1 billion years ago. And uh, yeah, so I will be focusing on the Kapwa Craton. So, uh, uh, an ancient piece of, of continent that now underlies much of uh, uh, the northern part of South Africa, extending into Botswana, but also being present in places like Swaziland. And in this map, in 
in color. And I mean, I'm based right here in Johannesburg, so right in the middle of it. So in this map, uh, everything that is shown in color represents rocks that formed in the Archean. So at the time uh, before 2.5 billion years ago. Now the oldest rocks in this area are granitoids and greenstones here in the eastern part. Greenstone belts shown in gray and in red, these are mainly granites. And these rocks, uh, well, they formed up to around 3.1 billion years ago, and then this area became a stable continent, and uh, younger uh, sedimentary and volcanic rocks became deposited on the top. So, um, the yeah, old supracrustal rocks you find in greenstone belts, and the most famous one is the Barberton belt up here in green. There are a number of smaller greenstone belts south of the Barberton belt. They contain rocks that are just as old, um, but yeah, the outcrop is, is uh, less good in many places. Well, yeah, the Barberton greenstone belt is probably one of the best uh, preserved ancient greenstone belts in the world. And um, in this map of the greenstone belt, the rocks shown in dark green, while well, they are made of largely mafic uh, volcanic rocks that formed on the seafloor um, 3.5 to 3.3 billion years ago. I had a possible modern analog in the form of this sea mount uh, that, um, uh, that is present in the Pacific Ocean. Now in the Barberton Greenstone Belt, there are also sedimentary rocks that are found in the middle part of this map. They are uh, mainly sedimentary rocks that formed a bit later, around 3.2 billion years. So I will be talking about greenstone belts, uh, or specifically the greenstones from South Africa, but I will also talk a bit about sedimentary and volcanic rocks that formed once the Kapwal Credon had stabilized. And these uh, are known to have been deposited from three billion years ago in the Dominion Pongola with waters from basin, right in the central portion of this very old continent. And the modern analog is um, maybe found like in Arctic Canada, where you have large amounts of uh, plastic sediment being transported by rivers into some shallow ocean and uh, yeah this is kind of a landscape that is characterized by a lack of vegetation which was something we had in during our key times okay so being based in johannesburg um, these rocks uh, are quite well exposed in this area um, Johannesburg is situated on sedimentary rocks that are three billion years old, part of the Dominion uh, with borders and sedimentary succession. And underlying these rocks are ancient greenstone belts. They are basically seen here in this photo of uh, an area in the Johannesburg region. And um, so, yeah, we can study these very old rocks basically by not having to travel far. Okay, so while well, the Earth has a long geological history, it started 4.6 billion years ago, um, I will be focusing as on one specific time interval between 3.5 and 3 billion years. Um, that is still a very large time interval, 500 million years, uh, a time when life uh, existed on Earth, a time when the first continent started to form, and well, the time when uh, there has been, or there is the first evidence for oxygenic photosynthesizers uh, uh, on the planet. Um, the focus of this talk are the conditions on Earth during the time interval, and here are the number of various kind of items that I will be discussing, and most of these kind of conditions that I will discuss I will be discussing have got um, like a geological record um, uh, preserved in South Africa. 
Okay, so I, I start off with, by discussing maybe the uh, kind of uh, that's how it looked like. Um, it was well, the planet covered largely with ocean. There were a few islands sticking out of this ocean, volcanic islands um, that um, were underlain largely by mafic volcanic rocks. As I said earlier, stable continents or cratons only evolved from 3.1 billion years onwards. Prior to that time, while well, we had continents in the make making, proto-continents, they evolved over hundreds of millions of years uh, from mafic volcanic effusions that piled up, become very thick, become internally differentiated to eventually form felsic rocks in the form of granites. But this took hundreds of millions of years and uh, the, uh, the earth and the sediments that were produced in this early time interval were dominated by material derived from volcanic rocks. There were some sediments that were relatively immature, there were some chemical sediments, but there was a lack of sand rich uh, or quartz sand rich sediments, such as those that form today along many beaches around uh, the world, such uh, sands that gave rise eventually to quartzites were not present at that time. The atmosphere of the Earth was very different. It was rich in greenhouse gases because well, 3.5 billion years ago, the luminosity of the sun was much lower. It was maybe only around 75% of the current uh, or the present uh, solar luminosity. And in order to, in order for the Earth not to become frozen and uh, become a snowball, um, CO2 levels or levels of a mix of greenhouse gases must have been quite high. And here in this, uh, in the right hand uh, of the slide, you see uh, a carbonate uh, silicate uh, model for CO2 level through time. And there are also a number of uh, data points shown uh, from proxy studies uh, that try to evaluate the amount of CO2 present in the Earth's atmosphere at that time. You see that most of these records, well, they straddle the Archean Proterozoic boundary. There's not a lot actually available for time older than three billion years. Most of these uh, studies, they, they looked at uh, so-called paleosols, which are fossil soils that can be used as an indicator for maybe how much CO2 was present in the atmosphere. Uh, soils, they formed due to the weathering of uh, uh, silicate minerals, and um, the weathering is strongly influenced by the amount of CO2 that is dissolved in the rainwater as well as in the groundwater. And if you do a careful chemical study of a, a paleosol, profile, you can, using mass balance, determine uh, uh, some estimate of the CO2 level in the atmosphere then. So the issue is that while well, paleosols are, are rare, and as you go farther back in time, while well, they become more and more rare, the photo that I show you is probably, well, one of the two oldest paleosols that have so far been found. And that uh, image is actually not from South Africa, it's from India, where you have 3.3 billion year old uh, granitoids having been subjected to weathering just before they were covered by 3 billion year old uh, sandstones. Um, another way to maybe determine uh, CO2 levels in the atmosphere uh, is by looking at uh, mineral equilibria. And I'll show you here in 
example of a mineral a sodium carbonate known as narcolite. Narcolite is only stable under very high uh, CO2 contents or so, uh, dissolved, let's say, in an alkaline brine. Um, narcolite you can expect to precipitate in an uh, alkaline lake if CO2 levels are very, very high. Today in alkaline lakes, like in the ones uh, in, along the East African Rift, you have Mortrona being the stable mineral, um, but, but narcolite would be stable if CO2 levels would be very high. And now you see a photograph of uh, a sedimentary rock, 3.4 billion years old. And this photo contains these beaches um, that are kind of upright. These have been interpreted by Don Law and students as uh, uh, former narcolite crystals. I mean, these are no longer made of narcolite, it's now made of chert. But um, um, people looked very carefully at the shape of these crystals and were able to show that most likely they represent narcolite. So this would be a good indicator, a good proxy for CO2 compositions uh, in the atmosphere. Another way to um, think about uh, CO2 is about maybe looking at the intensity of chemical weathering because uh, uh, the higher the CO2 level in rainwater, well, the more aggressive maybe the, the weathering may be. And here in this photo, okay, besides my backpack, <laughs> you see granite overlain by um, a sandstone. Now, um, this sandstone was deposited three billion years ago on this granite. There is no paleo soil developed at that contact, probably because the soil horizon was uh, eroded away uh, before deposition of this sand. Now, granite today and also in the past consists largely of well, cave feldspar, and you see those crystals here in that photo. Cave feldspar and quartz, these are the most uh, abundant minerals in the granite. Now, today, if granite weathers, I mean, you typically develop some kind of a sand on top of the granite, which consists of broken pieces of quartz and 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 feldspar. Um, but when you look at this sandstone that was deposited on top, it does not contain a single trace of feldspar. I mean, this is like a photo photo micrograph of this rock. And the only minerals you see are quartz, no feldspar, which suggests that maybe uh, the weathering was very intense and whatever feldspar there was, was basically uh, um, weathered to clay that was then washed away into deeper waters and warm parts of the ocean, only leaving behind the most stable material, in this case, quartz. So, yeah, likely rainwaters were quite acidic because of high CO2 levels and um, probably the oceans were acidic as well. Today's ocean on average has got a pH of 8.2 and slightly alkaline. There's a pH model of the oceans through time. So if we go back maybe around 3.5 million years ago, we find uh, pH level in that model be slightly acidic. And this could be a reason why actually there's not a lot of carbonate sediment preserved in the time interval I'm talking about. I mean today there's lots of carbonate, uh, carbonate rocks forming all around the world in tropical seas. They formed extensively in the Paleoproterozoic 2.5 billion years ago. But there's hardly any record of carbonates older than three billion years, possibly because, well, the oceans were too acidic for carbonate to actually precipitate. The only places where you find carbonates that are that old are one place in Australia, Australia Blue Church in uh, Western Australia, and the Pilbara Craton. Another place is in South Africa, in the non rainy greenstone belt. Here you see some stromatolite. But, well, actually, there is no carbonate left. It has been transformed into chert. 
Okay, staying with the atmosphere, um, it has been known for a long time, probably for 100 years, um, that the ancient atmosphere was probably somewhat different to, to the composition of the atmosphere today, especially in terms of oxygen content. And there are classic indicators uh, that show that oxygen level must have been quite low in the Earth's early history. Um, there are certain minerals such as pyrite, uraninite, siderite. These are not stable under oxygen rich conditions on the Earth's surface. But under anoxic conditions, they can be stable and they were indeed stable in the Earth's distant past. Also, sedimentary rocks known as red beds indicate oxygen conditions, iron leaching in fossil soils indicate anoxic conditions. So there is in the geological record time at around 2.3 billion years ago, when indicators for anoxic conditions disappear and indicators for oxy conditions make an appearance. So this is known as a great oxidation event. So this is uh, quite a nice uh, image of a, a rock that is basically well, it's a sedimentary rock that shows cross bedding um, consists of uh, small grains, sand sized grains that were deposited by some river in the past. Now there are these gray domains, they are largely made of sand uh, or quartz, sand uh, as well as pebbles of quartz. So this is, of course, what you'll find in most uh, rivers today. But there's this yellowish um, material. And this, when you look at it under the microscope, consists of these rounded clasts made of pyrite. So this is a sandstone, which is dominated by detrital pyrite. And this is something that you find only really in rocks that have been deposited prior to the great oxidation event 2.3 billion years ago. In, uh, well, in the Phanerozoic, or at any time um, um, when the atmosphere was oxygen rich, all sediments became deposited that nowadays appear red, especially sediments are formed in arid settings because like sand grains are coated by thin films of um, of iron oxides. So and these are called red beds. So red beds have been around for quite some time. But now when you look at Achaean sedimentary rocks, and here is a very long drill core through 2.95 billion year old sedimentary rocks of the Pongola supergroup. Well, you see that these rocks just um, come in different shades of gray. So they are gray beds. And no red beds in the Aki. And uh, another observation is the behavior of iron uh, during weathering. So if we look at modern day weathering profiles, we frequently observe that iron is concentrated uh, on the surface because under oxic conditions, uh, iron is immobile, it will become concentrated the top of the soil. But this uh, was very different during soil formation in the Archean. Uh, I show you a succession of rocks. Here we have got mafic rocks overlain by some sandstones. There's a contact. These rocks they were exposed to weathering two point, well close to three billion years ago, um, prior to deposition of these overlying sandstones. And uh, if you do some chemical profiles through these rocks, you find that at the top of the soil, aluminum contents are heavily enriched. That's commonly the case in, in many soils. That's how you form oxide. But as you see now here from the blue line, that is iron. Iron got basically heavily depleted at the top of the soil profile. And this is typical for weathering under anoxic conditions. 
But nevertheless, uh, we do uh, find evidence that there were places on our planet three billion years ago that were actually enriched in oxygen. And these uh, are known as oxygen oases. And in this photo here, I show you uh, the geological record of an oxygen oasis. What we have are uh, shales and banded iron formations, which formed in, uh, in, a, well, in, a, in a deeper part of, a sh of an overall shallow ocean that covered the Cap Barclay on three billion years ago. Maybe the water depth was, let's say, 20, 30, maybe 40 meters. And then these shales are abruptly overlain by sandstones that formed in a very shallow water uh, setting, similar to, let's say, the North Sea uh, tidal flats. We find lots of ripple marks, we find lots of mud cracks. There are lots of evidence for microbial mats preserved in these rocks. Now, if you look more carefully at especially the shales, you see that these rocks contain these uh, light colored layers and nodules that are rich in manganese carbonate. And there is some isotopic evidence that this manganese carbonate once uh, formed um, uh, as manganese oxide initially in the water column. And this is by looking at the uh, isotopic composition of, this, uh, of these rocks um, um, in terms of the molybdenum isotopes. Now, um, molybdenum can absorb to uh, manganese oxides in the water column. And this absorption leads to uh, fractionation of uh, molybdenum isotopes. And this fractionation is largest between seawater and uh, manganese oxides of several per mil. And uh, by looking at the isotopic composition of different samples from these shales, we see a large spread in the molybdenum isotope ratios that become more and more negative as we get to more manganese rich uh, sediments. And this uh, Evidence of, of molybdenum isotope fractionation indicates that manganese oxide must have been present in the water column, and manganese oxides require free oxygen to form. So this is the reason why we think there was this oxygen oasis in this shallow water environment um, of the uh, Pongola Sea. We had uh, oxygen-rich conditions in the shallow water because there were some oxygenic photosynthesizers living, giving rise to microbial mats and also stromatolites in places. Here you see some stromatolites from rocks slightly older below these shales. Um, and this oxygen oasis was bounded by, well, anoxic deeper water, and it was also bounded by the anoxic atmosphere. But um, yeah, so this is, these are like the characteristics of an oxygen oasis, a place that was more well, rich in oxygen and otherwise anoxic uh, conditions. Um, yeah, moving now to something else, to, to the magnetic field that, uh, um, that is or can become preserved in the geological record and that is preserved in rocks uh, as old as 3. Around 3.5 billion years ago. Uh, volcanic rocks, lavas, as they erupt, um, they can uh, preserve the ambient magnetic field um, as these rocks cool below the uh, Curie temperature of, of magnetite. And as a result of this, well, the uh, magnetic uh, field lines will become kind of fossilized, um, preserved in the rock. Now, what we see over here is a conglomerate which consists of chunks of, of the same rock. It is a volcanic rock that was eroded from, um, from a lava flow uh, a bit higher up in the succession. These um, chunks of volcanic rock, they crystallize at 
five billion years ago. And um, they all record uh, a direction of a magnetic field in the form of thermal, rent, uh, thermal remnant magnetization, which is plotted here in this um, diagram, which shows you know, like the uh, orientation of the of the field from the different samples um, in like geographic coordinates. So each of these class has got a, a magnetization that uh, is randomly distributed in this conglomerate. Uh, and that indicates well that these class were derived from erosion of a lava flow that was uh, uh, magnetized by, an, uh, by the Earth's magnetic field 3.45 billion years ago. So now, I mean, the magnetic field is important because uh, it, it does shield uh, planetary uh, atmospheres from the solar wind. If you don't have a magnetosphere, if you don't have um, shielding by a magnetic field, you may have parts of the atmosphere to become eroded by the solar wind. Now, um, uh, the same rocks were investigated to obtain information on the strengths of the magnetic field. Most of this work, all the, this work was done by John Taduno and, and students. Um, so from the same rocks, quartz grains were obtained. And these quartz grains, if you look under the microscope, you will find that they contain tiny inclusions of, uh, of magnetite. Now these magnetite inclusions, they can be analyzed for the strengths of the magnetic field that was present when these uh, magnetite grains uh, kind of formed and cooled below the Curie temperature. And um, this was done for these samples and it turned out that uh, the magnetic field strengths of the Earth 3.5 billion years ago was uh, 50 to, uh, to 70 percent of the present day atmospheric uh, magnetic shield. So that means uh, that um, the magnetopause, so basically the boundary between the solar wind and the magnetic field, was closer to the Earth, and that may have given rise to increased. Um, erosion of the atmosphere, of the Earth's atmosphere at that time. Obviously, we would like to know what was the magnetic field like, or was there a magnetic field four billion years ago? The problem with this approach is well, that, as I indicated earlier, there are no rocks present on Earth that are older than 3.5 billion years and have not been subjected to heating to um, levels above the uh, Curie temperature of magnetite, which is 580 degrees. So, so it's very difficult then to, to do this approach. Of course, I mean, people have looked at, uh, at, uh, uh, at magnetic field preserved in detrital circuits as old as uh, the Hadeans so or four billion years and even older, but there's at the moment quite a lot of debate on the, um, on the uh, on the measure, measurement technique as well as the age of the magnetic field that is recorded in these grains. So I won't really be going into that now. But um, yeah, I will move on to discuss a few aspects on meteorite flux uh, as preserved in the geological record. Well, there are, uh, I think the current estimate is around 200 uh, sites on our planet uh, where there is evidence that a meteorite hit, such as in the form of a crater. Now the oldest meteorite impact sites um, are Paleoproterozoic, so around 2 billion years to 2.2 billion years in age. One is in South Africa, the other is in, in Australia. So there is no older evidence uh, in the form of craters on Earth. Obviously, if we look at the moon, we see many impact craters, uh, many of which are definitely much older than uh, two billion years. And of course, there is um, quite a bit of information. Much of it is also quite heavily debated. 
on the uh, uh, meteorite flux and the cratering uh, frequency by looking at the moon. So, well, we do not really have any evidence for meteorite flux from the Archean record in terms of impact uh, craters, but we have got spheral layers. And the Barber and Greenstone belt is one of the places that is exceptionally rich in, in, in spheral layers. And, um, and these were mainly found and observed by John Law and students. So here uh, on the left side, you see a photo micrograph of one of these spheral layers. Maybe that one is around three to four centimeters in thickness. It consists of sand-sized spherical grains. And uh, you see here some photo micrograph of these, of these spherules. So now they have been known for more than 100 years in the rock record. People who have been mining for gold in, in that area uh, did come across these uh, regularly. But yeah, it was Don Law and Gary Biley who first regarded these spheral layers to be related to large meteorite impact processes. And that evidence is mainly linked to the presence of a relatively high extraterrestrial component in the form of iridium, several hundred ppb and some of these layers, as well as uh, uh, chromium isotope anomalies that were obtained from some of these layers, not from all, but from some. And um, yeah, so these are um, very good kind of indicators for, yeah, for impacting or impact cratering in the Earth's geological past. And um, well, I'm quoting here Bruce Simonson. They are not easy to find, but they are the best record of terrestrial impacts we've got from early in Earth history. So I'll show you a field photo. This dippled line uh, follows one sedimentary unit. Um, it's a chert that uh, is around one meter thick. And in this chert, you find two layers, each around 10 centimeters thick, which consists of uh, chunks of, of rock reworked probably by some large tsunami waves. And in these two layers, you find a certain number of spherules that are likely formed due to some large meteorite impact 3.47 billion years ago. And um, yeah, so these layers are not easy to find, but uh, once you find them, they are very interesting and can provide you with lots of information on ancient meteorite flux on Earth. Um, hydrothermal activity was uh, abundant on the early Earth. And uh, this is important because many people think that maybe hydrothermal vents were the birthplace uh, of life on Earth. And on Earth today, we see uh, hydrothermal activity on the continents in the shallow waters, but more, most importantly, also in the deep waters um, uh, on yeah, along the mid oceanic ridges. And um, probably in the Archean, hydrothermal activity was even more pronounced because the uh, heat flux from the Earth was much higher in the Earth's distant past. The Earth was much more rich in radioactive elements such as potassium and uranium in its early days. And because of this, well, much higher uh, amounts of heat were, uh, were kind of released from this center of the, the Earth. And thus giving rise to probably larger amounts of hydrothermal activity on the Earth's surface. Um, well, here you see 3.4, 3.5 billion year old rocks that formed on an ancient seafloor. They are largely made of uh, uh, lava flows of salt, uh, much similar to what you observe in, on modern day uh, seafloors. Um, in between these lava flows, you find thin sedimentary units. Uh, they were deposited when there was an uh, uh, episode of volcanic quiescence. 
Now these uh, churls, when you look at them in the field, you know that the rocks underneath are always intensely altered. They are silicified, they are carbonated, they are veined by fractures that indicate that fluids at high pressures must have fractured these rocks. And this is typical for well, what you find in submarine hydrothermal springs. And um, so, yeah, there is plenty of evidence throughout these ancient greenstone successions for hydrothermal activity. And here you see some photo of some fractured rocks cut by some veins filled with organic rich uh, chert. And uh, along the walls of these fractures, you see features that resemble microbial mats. And if you zoom in, you can also find filamentous features that indicate that maybe these hydrothermal systems were actually teeming with life. Um, these hydrothermal systems, where they were relatively low temperature, not much hotter than 100 degrees, so they were suitable for life to exist. Um, so there's plenty of evidence of microbial life in in these uh, ancient greenstone successions, but only because they are well preserved. We find traces of maybe fossil microbes. Uh, we find, well, maybe not that many stromatolites because as I said earlier, carbonates are rare, but nevertheless, there's quite a lot of evidence for microbial mat related structures. You find evidence for bio alteration on the glassy rims of pillow basalts. And there's also quite a lot of carbonaceous matter in sedimentary rocks of that age that indicate that life was was quite widespread. And that was yeah, as far back as 3.5 million years ago. Much or all of this life is linked to, to marine or coastal kind of environments. So what about life on the continents? Well, as I said earlier, well, continents only started to exist from 3.1 billion years ago with the Cap Valcredon. But yeah, so the Cap Valcredon um, um, was later on then uh, covered by some volcanic rocks as it drifted, as it was subjected to some extension. And this gave rise to the deposition of the volcanic succession of the Dominion group. So this is an intracontinental uh, volcanic succession dominated by basalts as well as rhyolites or basic volcanic lavas. And this is a stratigraphic column of the Dominion group. Here we have got mafic volcanic rocks, basalts. Here we have felsic volcanic rocks higher up. Uh, all, everything sits on granites of the Capval Craton. And in between those uh, felsic volcanic flows, we find relatively thin sediment horizons. Here's an outcrop of one of these sedimentary units. You see the planar bedding of this material. Well, they, well this is now, uh, there are two lava flows in contact with each other. So these are rhyolitic lava flows. And uh, well, these sediments sit in between. And well, here are some photos of these sediments. It's mainly black shale and very dark gray colored uh, uh, sandstones. They are quite rich in organic matter up to 1.5% total organic carbon with relatively fractionated carbon isotopic composition. So here we see evidence for an abundance of microbial life um, on the continent. And we think probably in large caldera lakes that um, were present in this volcanically active terrain with uh, an abundance of nutrients, largely because well, the pH levels in these waters were pretty low. Uh, and this is what we see from the composition of these sediments in which this carbonation matter occurs. So yeah, I mean, um, so early life and on the continent, at least by three billion years. And here's maybe a modern day example of such an acidic lake um, that host um, microbial life. And then, well, um, there has also, or there is, we did just recently, we came across, come across this paleosol, uh, so a fossil soil that at the very top is quite dark in color. And this uh, dark colored material consists of well, carbonaceous matter. 
uh, sometimes in the form of these ripped up mats. And it shows some isotopic fractionation, which is indicative of uh, uh, photosynthetic microbes that were li living in these soils at that time. Well, I mean, this is a bit uh, out of the scope of this talk because now this is a polysol, which is a bit, quite a bit younger. That's 2.6 billion years in age from South Africa. Okay, so in conclusions, um, well, the conclusions are basically what I discussed uh, earlier, the various surface conditions um, that we went through now um, that have um, kind of, that are recorded in the geological record of, uh, of South Africa. And with this, yeah, I just want to thank various students and, and researchers at the University of Johannesburg, a couple of collaborators from around the world, uh, some funding agencies. And uh, well, I also want to acknowledge uh, Nick Burkes, uh, uh, professor at the University of Johannesburg, who uh, was well uh, was a well-known uh, Precambrian sedimentologist who, well, unfortunately passed away in January this year. Okay, so thank you very much for listening to that presentation. May I ask one question? Yes, please. Can you see me? Ah, hello. Uh, hello, th thank you very much for, for your talk. I like a lot. Uh, I wonder, you, you said in, in, in one of your uh, slides that uh, this sample contains different type of uh, biomarkers. What what kind of biomarkers have you detected in, 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 in I would say, which is the oldest rock where you were able to identify it, um, molecular biomarkers. I mean, I oh, guess yeah. the biomarkers are limited, something like that. But which is the, the, uh, the most ancient sample? And also another question is, how do you deal? Because I always always ask myself because this is complicated to to avoid contamination from younger periods. How do you deal with this? Okay, well, yeah, I mean, you're right. Look, I mean, I put this in brackets, uh, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, obviously there has been, there has been quite a bit of uh, search for these biomarkers from these very ancient rocks and they were all shown to be younger contamination or many of them. Um, there have been, uh, there has been some, some work done on some of these uh, uh, 3.4 billion year old, old shirts uh, from the Barberton belt. Um, but this work is still, I mean, people who are, um, uh, compiled this information are still battling to get it published. <laughs> so yeah, at the moment, this is still in brackets. I mean, sorry, I mean, yeah, I should not maybe have mentioned it. Uh, <laughs> it's something, you know, that is maybe forthcoming, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... Thank you for yeah, the very interesting. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, thank you for that very interesting overview and talk. I wonder um, when you talked about uh, archaeomagnetism, is there a way to te uh, to tell whether this is really a global phenomenon or whether this is more localized things? Because I can't imagine that they still all point in the same direction. There must have been a lot of uh, brassiation and upheaval going on. Um, yes, I mean, the thing is, of course, uh, like uh, people have been doing paleomagnetic work for, for decades and uh, and uh, people have also tried to get some results from the Archean record. It, uh, it took quite a while, you know, to get uh, get to the bottom of, of it and get maybe some uh, some results out of the rocks that people actually believed is uh, some kind of a primary magnetization that formed uh, that uh, long ago. Um, now, I mean, the thing is, um, like in South Africa, I mean, every magnetization uh, would have a different direction through time because, I mean, uh, continents, they, they, they move, uh, magnetic fields flip, 
Um, so, I mean, it is not not uh, something straightforward <laughs> to yeah. investigate. Yeah. Um, and obviously, I mean, people also do paleo mag work in Australia, and um, and well, I mean, in the end, of course, people try maybe to to get paleo mag results from rocks of the same age, uh, maybe in different credons to see, you know, how these credons or continents were maybe linked or related in, in space uh, on the planet. But yeah, I mean, it is. <laughs> not something straightforward, but there's a huge amount of data uh, that's out there, and there's more coming out of it. Okay, so so um, yeah, the evidence for a global magnetic field is 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 there. Yes, I mean wherever you maybe study, the problem is you know there are not that many rocks around the world, you know that are yeah, three point no. years old and um, that uh, have not been remagnetized or that have not been heated to temperatures above the Curie temperature. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so there is not much out there, but what is out there and was analyzed seemed to be in favor of yeah, a global magnetic field at that time. Okay, great, yeah, thank you. <laughs>